All right, well, let's just start a little bit. Um, we have um, several attendees and you're welcome to put any questions you have for Amy in the Q&A or write something in the chat if you'd like to talk amongst yourselves. Um, we are so excited. We have been just giddy over this book. And before, so Elizabeth's gonna officially introduce Amy Jo, but I want to give like a little bit of story. I stumbled upon this book in the Penguin Random House catalog. And I was like, that sounds so interesting. And so um, I was able to read it and then immediately, I think emailed our rep. And I was like, how dare you not tell us about this book? <laughs> and I think he, it flew under the radar for him too. And I was like, we are, we're not letting this fall under the radar at all, which I know you've gotten a lot of publicity with Barnes and Noble, even um, promoting your book, which I, it's just, it's so good. And I hope everybody got a chance to read it. If you haven't, we'll give, um, you know, some spoiler alerts if you sure. need to, you know, go get a drink or something when we do that. But um, I am thrilled to have you because I love the book and completely basically made Elizabeth read it. And then we've probably had several of our staff members read it. Even the other co-owner, Kimberly, I think she read it in like two days. Oh, you guys are the best. Thank you. <laughs> we love good books, so it's easy. But um, anyway, so welcome everybody. And we're so excited to get started. All right. Yeah, I know. Um, as soon as Allison read it, she texted me. I think it was right at the beginning of quarantine. And she said, I've just read a book and it's really, really good. I want to hear what, you know, make sure you like it too. I absolutely loved this book. It's still my top three of the year. I've read over a hundred books this year so far <laughs> and top three. I just was floored by it. I love stories of Appalachia and this just hit all the buttons for me. So um, let me introduce our speaker tonight. Amy Jo Burns is the author of the memoir, Cinderland and Shiner. Her writing has appeared in the Paris Review Daily, Tin House, Plowshares, Good Housekeeping, Electric Literature, Literary Hub, and the anthology, Not That Bad. So without further ado, Amy Jo Burns, please tell us a little bit more about yourself and the inspiration behind this fabulous book. Sure. First of all, I want to say thank you so much to Allison and Elizabeth and everybody at Fable. I mean, you guys are a writer's dream and I, you know, do not take it for granted for one second, especially I think now with things being so terrible and weird, anytime I'm able to connect with a reader about my book, it is just, it, it gives, it's so life-giving to me. So thank you. Um, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Right now I live in central Jersey um, but I grew up in Northern Appalachia in Western Pennsylvania. And um, when I was a teenager, I spent some summers in West Virginia camping. And I think, you know, even before I even dreamed of becoming a writer, because, you know, where I grew up, people didn't become writers. And if they did, they weren't women. You know, um, West Virginia just had this really special place in my heart. It's so beautiful. And you just get the sense when you're there that the landscape is telling this story and you are merely witnessing it, you know? So I think even before I dreamed of becoming an author, it was, it was a story that was kind of writing itself um, in me. And, you know, I haven't lived there in, in quite some time, but I still consider Appalachia home. Um, I grew up also in a faith healing church. So if you've read the book, there's um, a, a snake handling preacher who figures pretty importantly in the book. Um, so I didn't, I don't have any experience per se with snake handling, but I did grow up in a church where people spoke in tongues and did the laying on of hands and prophecy and all that. So that is definitely, um, obviously comes, comes through in the novel, but um, all the books I've read that are about things like that, they feel like they're very from the outside looking in. And I wanted to write something that really got so you felt like you were inside it and you could see the eerie strangeness and maybe some of the, you know, really dangerous aspects of it, but equally you see the beauty and you see why people kind of choose that way of life. I wanted to make sure there was some balance, even though I think everybody at some point you step back and you say, these people are making some bad decisions. <laughs> um, you can sort of see why there's this, there's this pull to this thing that kind of keeps them coming back to something larger, right? There's this larger sense of faith. Um, that I think carries out throughout the novel. But really, when I started writing it, I just wanted to write about what it's like to be a woman who has a story that's gone unheard. 
and what it means to try to tell that story and sort of like all the reverberations. So I think at the heart of the book, that's really what it is for me. Love it. That's so great. I love what you said about feeling like, um, by the way, I'm just <laughs> I'm in the acquaintance now. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we played around with some virtual backgrounds, but it does feel like that where it is, in you're in the inside and everything felt so I the way I described this book was like lyrical and haunting mm -hmm. like full of mystery and it was just so so good so I have a question for you yeah um Shiner centers on the stories of three women Ren her mother Ruby and Ruby's best friend Ivy living on an isolated mountain in coal country now the opening line of the novel is just so good like if if you we're like, okay, maybe I'll read like 10 pages and see if I'm interested. The first line I think would draw you in. Making good moonshine, isn't that different from telling a good story and no one tells a story like a woman, which absolutely love that. Um, so tell us about kind of your idea of like woman being a storyteller and, and the importance of women's voices, especially in this particular environment. Yeah. Um... So, you know, I mentioned, and I will say, so that the beginning of the book was the very last thing that I wrote. And I didn't actually realize that the book kind of needed that kind of intro to sort of set up what was at stake here. Because like I mentioned, you know, wanting to write a, a story about what it's like to be a woman whose story has gone unheard. I just feel like there's, there's really heavy stakes with that. So I wanted to make sure the beginning, you knew right from the get-go, like this is something like people are kind of putting their lives on the line to speak out the truth, you know? Um, so I think I wanted um, to write something that was the story behind the story, right? And how a woman will tell the story that a man has told, but completely subvert it, right? Because I really believe oftentimes when we hear these great stories of, you know, men of great faith, men of great failure, there's always a woman behind it, right? And they've got all these secrets. And I won't spoil anything just in case there's somebody who hasn't read the book, but um, these women are carrying some really juicy secrets. And they have lived these rich histories that the men in their lives know nothing about. And, you know, I think what's particular to women telling stories is the same as women deciding to keep secrets. You know, oftentimes it's about survival. And Ruby, who's the mother in the novel, she keeps some secrets for a long time because it's survival for her. But then she gets to the point where she's realizing how keeping those secrets and not telling those stories has had this sort of cascading effect on her child. And so she reaches the point where she says, when, how, when and how do I tell these stories to my child, these difficult stories? Um, and so the book is sort of about that, that wrestling about everything that silence says and when it's time to break the silence. And I think that women in particular understand the risk because there's so much at stake every time you open your mouth, you know, whether you decide to be silent or whether you're going to speak out, um, there's a price to pay for either one. I, I absolutely, one of my favorite parts of the book was the friendship between uh, Ruby and Ivy. Um, you don't hear about these strong female friendships, adult friendships especially. Um, but what was the inspiration for that friendship? Um, it does seem like the, the power of female friendship is a huge theme of the book. Yes. You know, any women like, like them. Yes. I. So, I mean, I think, do I know any women like them? I do, but I think in this kind of society or community, it is so hard for women to maintain that strong bond because men sort of are like these weeds <laughs> that grow up in, in between. And you kind of see that happening in the book and you see both Ruby and Ivy fighting to hold on to each other. And I, I wanted to really explore like why it is so hard to hold on to those relationships. And I think um, what ends up happening, like it, oftentimes in tales of romance, which I love, of course, I mean, that's in Shiner as well. You sort of are getting the sense like the relationship of a lifetime is the person that you marry, right? And then, but we see that in Shiner, it's like, that's not true. You know, Ruby has this, the, the relation, the love of her life with her best friend. And, um, you know, there's other people that she loved and cared for, but that was the, the thing that she was willing to move mountains for was her best friend. And I think that the, the friendship between Ruby and Ivy 
is that constant on the mountain that everybody looks to for stability and support. I mean, even though there's this snake handling creature who says he can do miracles and drink strychnine and be fine, it's really this friendship that people look to to say we are okay. And when that starts to have some cracks in it is when everything else sort of starts to fizzle. And it's also, you know, Ren, who's the first narrator at the beginning of the book, she's 15. She looks to this friendship to understand what it means to be a woman. And I think, you know, she sees her mother who always plays inside the lines and she sees Ivy who is always going outside the lines. And I think what Ren ends up discovering is that it's not whether you're inside or outside the lines, it's the lines themselves that are the problem. So, I mean, hopefully over the course of the novel, what ends up happening is that that friendship is this ultimate subtle but powerful act of resistance. And that's the thing that ultimately Ren learns to gather strength from, hopefully. So early in the novel, Ivy tells Ren, weddings or funerals, don't you dare dream of them. Ivy's and Ruby's lives have been hampered by the men they have chosen to marry, which we all grieved. Did mm -hmm. you see this growing up? Which I read kind of some background about your um, upbringing in mm -hmm. Adelaide, and I would love to hear kind of like, were there figures in your life that you based any of the men on? Yes. Um, I mean, yes and no. I mean, the truth is Ruby and Briar in particular, so the mother and then the snake handling preacher, they are sort of composites of a lot of different people I knew, but a huge inspiration for them, I think, were my grandparents. My, my grandmother, there's a lot of similarities between her and Ruby. Um, my grandmother loved beautiful things, but was unbelievably practical. She loved to sew dresses, was so talented, um, loved, you know, beautiful things. And my grandfather was a very charismatic, very popular man um, who was the devil to live with. And I mean, not, not by any particular malice, but just ego unchecked, which is exactly what, what Breyer's problem is. And um, so I think that seeing some of their relationship play out and sort of see my grandmother develop this, you know, depth of character <laughs> while she's kind of, you know, she had five children of her own. Her husband was in a, a lot of ways, her sixth child. Um, and me feeling that frustration on her behalf, um, I think a lot of the heart that I have for those characters comes, comes through and who they are. And, um, but, you know, my grandmother chose, chose him, continued to choose to live with him and care for him. And I mean, it's, it's this double-edged sword because there's something that's so beautiful and that kind of emptying out of oneself for somebody else, but it's so problematic. And it just feels like this huge loss, which is, you know, I mean, when you think about like the landscape in Appalachia, hopefully there's some sort of, you know, correlation between what women do on behalf of others and sort of how we're treating, you know, the land in Appalachia. But um, I mean, there's a lot of differences between my grandfather and Briar, but I think I knew a lot of men that sort of believed mostly in the myth of themselves and it caused danger to their families. And so that's kind of something I wanted to like bring out in the book. Yeah, discuss Briar is fascinating. We, I would love to hear more about your inspiration for him and, and his white eye. <laughs> get the yeah. image out of my head <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that's sort of I don't quite even know where that came from it's one of those writer things that sort of appears and you're kind of like like you said it's a little haunting and you think oh I'd like to include that um I you know I think when we talk about what inspired me to write the book I also wanted to write about people who feel misunderstood and how that sort of uh changes the trajectory of a life and I think Breyer feels really misunderstood by the people closest to him, you know, his, his wife and his best friend. Um, and he sort of is, like I said, he ends up kind of clinging to this myth of his, of his power. But, in, and I think what's important to note is that, you know, his faith is misguided, but it's not counterfeit. You know, I think he, I wanted to write somebody who, is not like is ambitious, but not in the way that like city people are ambitious. He does not care about money. He does not care how big his church is. What he is looking for is like 
God's presence to sort of show up in some miracle way, because that, those are the men that I knew when I was growing up. Like they didn't, they didn't care about money. They, they cared about making lasting things with their hands. And um, I feel like every preacher in every book that you, is like, you know, that's the villain or the antagonist. He's always wanting money or something like that. I'm like, I don't know men like that when I grew up, you know, it's just such a, it's a really different way to live. So um, I, I wanted to write somebody who is a, is a villain, but you can sort of understand maybe how the environment created him, even though he is a hundred percent responsible for all the terrible things that he does. It's an environment that kind of created a place where somebody like him can kind of rise to power. Um, yeah. And I mean, he's somebody I still have a lot of compassion for. It's funny when I talk to readers, they're like, oh, I hated him. But, you know, in some ways it's like, I feel like he's one of my like wayward children. <laughs> right. He's a product of his environment. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and being, you know, being unchecked, like I said, sort of thinking, um, because you're a man, you sort of have that holy stamp of God, and then we will not question you. And um, I that has caused, I think, a lot of problems in a lot of communities. That makes sense. I think there's a quote from the House of Cards that I've always thought about that said, why would you want money when you could have power? Mm -hmm. and I am always like, you know, that's true. Like, usually people who are bad leaders want one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes sense that he, he just really wanted power and influence and was given it. Yes. Without check. Because, exactly. Because people believed that for some reason they could never relate to God the way that Briar Bird did. And that is where things started to go haywire, I think. That makes sense. Um, so what is funny is when I was reading the book, before I got to Caleb, I could not tell what time period we were in. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, wait, 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 it's like present time. Mm -hmm. he, to me, he kind of represent almost like a, a window to the outside world to so that we were like, oh, like the place and time we we're at is modern day, even though the group of these people feels like they're living in, you know, a long time ago. Right. Um, kind of tell us about, um, well, I will ask this because when the, when the book ended, I was kind of like, oh, well, now I want to know more about Ren and Caleb. Yeah. You get inquiries about the sequels to this book? Yes, I do. Um, and, you know, I will say I've gotten that comment quite a bit. It makes so much sense to me. Like people are like reading it, like, when are we? And the reason I wrote it that way was because I really wanted, when you feel that disorientation, when you're like, oh, snap, like we are in current day, like that's what Ren feels every time she tries to step into society. She sort of feels like, I was not made to belong here, right? And I think Caleb comes along and says, you know what? Yes, you can belong here. And the people who tell you you can't are, are harming you, you know? And so I, I wanted to give her someone who, who understood what it means to be an outside and who outsider and, and who understood what real danger looks like. Um, but I mean, so all that to answer your question, I get asked, that all the time are you going to write again? And, you know, at first I thought, no, this is done, you know, but when people ask me, especially, you know, people want to think Flynn deserves his own book and he's my favorite character in the book. He's the moonshiner. Um, so I'm not ruling it out. I mean, I wanted to leave it open-ended because I, I think what I hope happens for the characters in the novel, or maybe mostly for Ren, is that she starts out the book feeling like I have no choice in anything. And then by the end of the book, she says, she sort of is realizing I do have a choice. I have a choice to claim my home. I can leave, I can come back. And that's the note that I wanted to leave it on is that she is somebody who has a choice that she didn't have before. Um, so I would like to write a sequel. I think it will take me some time because you always want to write something that will be just as good or will be just as you know potent as what you did. So I was probably, I think I probably need to mature in some, <laughs> you know what I mean? Go through some life experiences yeah. before I revisit book? it. I don't remember if we look, is this your first one? So, um, I wrote a memoir. Uh, okay. so this is my first novel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
But, you know, and then I also didn't want to pin Caleb down to a geography because I wanted to honor whatever his personal story might be. I mean, because of like the narrative that's at play, he's kind of a supporting character. But in truth, the way I think about it, he's living his own story where he is the protagonist. And I didn't want to like nail that down. I wanted to leave him some because he deserves a choice too about whether he wants to stay or go. Um, so that's kind of why I, I left it open-ended. So we'll see. That's so exciting. Okay, a slight pivot now. Yeah. So, um, we usually have a themed drink for our book club. <laughs> and um, I, I chickened out. I didn't, I was scared me. So I, I, I have bourbon, okay. which I just, I read a new book called Pappy Land coming out next month, all about bourbon. And I've learned that the stuff that blows up to the top is moonshine. So that, mm -hmm. I, feel, I feel like it's okay doing bourbon. I was a little, a little scared of moonshine, but you know, um, bourbon is like moonshine's like older cousin that's been around for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd love to know um, how you learned so much about moonshine. Yeah. The way you wrote about it, it was so beautiful. Um, do you like to drink it? This is something most of us probably on this um, webinar are from Texas. We're not, yeah. moonshine is not in our. Um, our DNA. Yeah. So please explain a little more about the shine. <laughs> yeah. You know, so um, Appalachia, or maybe Northern Appalachia, is sort of on the corn belt, and moonshine is basically just corn whiskey. But I mean, I will tell you, moonshine came as a complete surprise to me. I only happened to come across information on when I was doing research on, you know, taking up serpents and faith healing and that kind of thing. And I'd read this book of oral history. Um, you guys have probably heard of it. It's called the Foxfire Anthology, but it's like tons of books where these teenagers go into the mountains of Appalachia and just interview older people about like what old time mountain life was like. You know, if you want to learn how to like make soap or chair caning or whatever, I mean, they cover it all, but it's in you're reading oral history. And in the book I was reading right next to the faith healing section was this section called Moonshining as Fine Art. And I was so taken with the title. I just started reading. And at the time I um, had my first son, you know, he, he was early. So he was a preemie. He never slept. And it was like the summer and I was up at night we were both up at night. I had insomnia and I was reading about these moonshiners who were also up at night in the summer alone. And I felt this, they, they kept me company during a really like lonely time when I was trying to like find a new sense of myself. And I think I fell in love with them before I even knew what moonshine tasted like, because, you know, throughout the course of writing this book, I was pregnant twice nursed two kids twice. So I didn't have a lot of opportunities to try moonshine, you know? And at first I was frustrated because I thought, you know, if you're a writer, you got to go out into the woods and you got to, you know, do your <laughs> research and stuff. But um, I ended up being really glad that it played out like it did because I was sort of, I had to push past what people would say, oh, it tastes like this or things like that. And think like, let's not think about what it tastes to maybe an outsider, but what does it mean? Like, what does it mean to these people? And that was really what I think ran away with my heart was that it, it is these people, it's their, it's a cultural footprint. It's a family heirloom. This is, it represents, you know, something a father hands down to a child. It represents their land. It's the way that they make something of the life that they live. And um, I really liked the contrast of that earthiness with sort of this otherworldliness that that Briar inhabits and then the fact that these two men are best friends and they continue to butt heads because they're like complete their worldviews are completely different based on how they like what they do with their hands basically you know we've got one man who's sort of like healing doing all these things and this other man who's like there's something very miraculous I think about taking water sugar and corn and like making whiskey out of it there's something like inspired about that you know but they they can't get along because they're kind of they see they see the world very differently so um Amy will you repeat the title of that book that you yes it's oh, so it's called a reader that, I mean uh, um attendee the asked 
So it's called the Foxfire Anthology. And there are so many of this, this book. I mean, they're still printing them now, but they started them in like maybe the 1970s, something like that. The one that I read, I think is the very first one. And it says right on the front, something like moon shining, faith healing. Um, but if you're ever looking for like such an entertaining nonfiction read, any one of those is just fascinating. They're really, they're really wonderful books. So great. Taking notes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and then, um, on Elizabeth's um, comment about the book Pappy Land, um, that comes out next month. And you can pre-order that on our site too, if you just search for it. Um, just wanted to make a note in case this has uh, made you interested in all the things moonshine and um, your, she read it, loved it. She said she learned so much. So that's really good. I loved it. Um, okay, so this is a little bit of a spoiler alert. Um, when I say little, I mean a lot. <laughs> So if you have not finished the book, feel free to take a break <laughs> or just cover your ears. Um, okay. So the whole time I was reading the book, you know, and just hating Briar so much and, you know, fun fact, my husband is a pastor. So it was interesting to see the worst of the worst <laughs> in and just hating him. And I, in my back mind, I kept going, but the miracle. But the miracle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about that? Like what we, there's, there's some reckoning that needs to happen. So the yeah. surprising twist just made the novel so special to me that I just was like, okay, I love this book. Five stars. Um, <laughs> did, I mean, you could talk a little bit about how you decided to do that, or was that your intention in the beginning that it was going to go this way? Yeah. And then also second part of the question is talking about Ren, her decision to stay. Yeah. after we learned everything. Mm -hmm. um, so regarding the miracle, it's interesting. You know, I wrote so many drafts of this book and something I held on to when I was writing it was I really wanted there to be this air of mystery around this miracle because I think a big part of like maybe my faith experience growing up and maybe what it means to to live there is that there were just these things that happened that nobody could explain and um i i wanted to give that space in the book and so the first you know five drafts or so i i had it at the end where ren is sort of like we do not know what happened um and you know meaning did did briar really hear heal Ivy, did something else happen? Um, and then um, I think it really took me sharing the book, you know, with my agent and editor, people who obviously did not grow up like that, um, to say, no, we really need to like come down on one side or the other with this, because that's important for the story you're telling. And that was the first time I, I kind of realized that this was a book that I was writing for people in this community, but also people who have, do not know anything about this kind of community. And that's why I made the decision to, to um, make it clear, you know, what, what had really happened with Ivy. Um, because what was most important to me with the book is sort of this, what comes at the cost of sort of like celebrating men as these sort of like you know, gifts from God, you know, not that they're not, but it's sort of like at the, at the expense of, of women. And I felt like if that's, if that's the note that I want to leave on, then I've got, really got to make a decision. And it's interesting, like I, how your subconscious as a writer sort of is always in your corner. Cause that when I went back and said, okay, how am I going to fix this? I'd left myself like all these little Easter eggs, you know, that it made sense that, you know, so there was something else happening with Ivy but nobody could see, or you see what you want to see, right? In, in that kind of circumstance. So, um, and it's it, it's funny because you know after my dad read the book, we were talking about it, and he said, "I really, really wish that you hadn't had made made that happen. I, I wish that Briar would have been able to maintain maybe some of that reality." And so that was kind of interesting. And then I had this conversation with him. I was like, well, let's think about who's probably reading this book. It's not going to be people like you and me who like grew up in this, you know? So, um, so if anybody out there was reading and they felt that way, you know, my dad, my dad, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
keep going. But I was just going to say, you know, to answer your question about Ren deciding to stay, that was something I think from the very beginning when I was writing the book, I mean, this book had a hundred different plot, plot lines before I could finally settle on what was actually going to happen. But what I wanted to write about was people who have ambition, but have no desire to leave home or people who have ambition, but do not have geographic mobility because geographic mobility often is a privilege. Um, Cause I, I think I, I get asked that a lot. Like, well, you know, why didn't you just leave this place if you didn't like it's like that's not it's not that easy you know to just pick up and and leave everything that that you know so i think what ren's journey as i was you know getting to know her and i was uh, as i was writing and trying to figure out you know what is she wrestling with as she's sort of coming of age is i i think um i wanted her to understand what it means to claim home and i think When you claim home, you can leave and you can return. You can decide I'm keeping these traditions and I'm letting these go. You can say, you know, these things I believed were true are not. Um, I'm still, to be honest, I'm I'm still not in my head, you know, my cloud that exists around the novel. Does, Does she stay? Does she go? I don't. I don't know. I think it's, I think it's everything. And I think it's, you know, yes. And I think it's, you know, she, she will leave, she will come back. Um, Cause I think that's been my relationship with home is that like, even if you leave, you're not really gone. Like there's still so much of me that is there and traveling home for me is so much more than traversing the miles. Like there's another like psychic journey that has to happen for me when I go there. Um, so I wanted to kind of give Ren, Ren some like breathing room to say, you know what, I, I don't have to run away from this. I can, I can hold on to some of the good things. Um, but yeah, I guess I just wanted to like leave it sort of her being like, you know, maybe I'll stay, maybe I'll go. Cause that was sort of her mother, <clears throat> her mother didn't have that. And I think her mother and Ivy both sacrificed so much so that Ren could have that. I think, I don't remember a more satisfying ending to a book. I, I love <laughs> loved it so much. But I also, I love the idea of, of Ren staying, but mm-hmm. really having, helping to break the cycle yeah. of what a woman in Appalachia is like. So mm-hmm. maybe that's why she stays. I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's exactly it. I, I think what I, I wanted to take to task this idea that if there's something wrong with where you grew up, you know, you've got to leave because a, a lot of, there, there's a lot of stereotypes about what Appalachia is like, you know, it's sort of lampoon for being, you know, poverty stricken and ill-educated and all these things. And I mean, it's just such a narrow view of what is like a very wide and varied people group. Yeah. And so I, yeah, I think I kind of wanted to turn that traditional narrative of, you know, it's only coming of age if she gets out of there. It's like, no, that's not, there's, there's a wider story there. You know, I might've left home, but all my best friends still live there and are living these incredibly full and rich lives and narratives. Um, so I think I kind of wanted to give some voice to that choice too. Mm-hmm. Uh, Amy Jo, you, we, we love how you um, write in such an accessible way, but oh, very beautifully. Um, so who were some of your inspirations, some of your writers who you gain a lot of inspiration from, or even just uh, authors you like to, to read? So, um, there's so many that I love. I think that Alice Walker is somebody that I love. You know, she wrote The Color Purple. Um, that's one of my favorite books. Um, she also wrote a book of essays called In Search of Our Mother's Gardens that I just love. Another favorite of my Sue Monk kid is I love her so much. <laughs> you know, <laughs> something that's been fun about these like virtual things, like I would have never been able to go to an event with her. And, you know, I was able to attend one just as a reader and I was able to send her a chat that was like, I love you. I'm your biggest fan. <laughs> So that was special. But anyway, so she's a favorite of mine. And I, cause I think that she's very accessible, but she writes about women in this very deep way. Um, and who else do I love? You know, um, 
Joanne Beard is someone else that I love. She's an essayist and has written a novel or two. Um, Jane Austen, uh, Jane Eyre is a book I love. Uh, Daphne du Maurier, who wrote Rebecca, is like a favorite, favorite, favorite of mine. It felt like the American version of the English Moors. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I dig that. Like I, yeah, that is, that is my jam right there. If I like can have a trademark, that's what I want for my writing style. Cause those are the, like, yeah, Jane Eyre, Rebecca, all those sort of like spooky, you know, things. Um, let me see recently. What have I read that I loved? Um, I, last year, my favorite book of the year, I loved Daisy Jones and the six. I don't know if you guys read it. I loved oh, yeah. that book. Yeah. Um, this year, what have I loved? I really liked Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. That was really great. Um, Take Me Apart by Sarah Sliger. I'm not much of a thriller um, reader typically, but I loved that book. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think I, I've, I've got a lot of different inspirations here and there. Yeah. Um, you, I wanted to follow up when you were talking about your dad saying he yeah. it was the miracle had actually happened. What What is yeah. it like to write a book about a place where your friends still live or your family is still there? I mean, is that humbling in some ways? Is it <clears throat> awkward? Do people give you, feed, like, do local friends there give yeah. you feedback on things? Yeah. yeah, so I will say, so, you know, I mentioned my first book, Cinderland, um, that one was the one that I think was really hard for everyone to read because that was a memoir and it was sort of, um, you know, talking about a really difficult scandal that was covered up in, uh, our town when I was, you know, in middle school and then high school, um, it's sort of the reverberations. It's sort of about why young women have to keep secrets and the cost that that has. Um, so that was the book that I think was hard for my parents. It was hard for my sister. Um, I will say my friends are ride or die. They just <laughs> like showed up for me in a really incredible way. Um, so I'm, I think it's, I think it's hard. I think it's hard, um, to read something like that and say, uh, like you, you probably, you know, uh, exaggerated this a little bit or it, it's just it's weird to read about your life but I my two closest friends were kind of like you got it on the money you know so that always feels good but I always tell people I leave room to let you know like there are people that feel like I, I get it wrong and that just goes to show you how complex and complicated life there is and nobody kind of feels the same way about it um so I mean my parents are ridiculously proud of me um and I will go then when, I, when I'm asking about truck tires, when I want to know about, you know, <laughs> cigarettes or even, you know, my parents are like very well read as well. So they um, are in terms of like inspiration. I think my parents and their lives are probably like my number one inspiration of things that I think are interesting to write about. But I think also with that, they have to like give me a long leash of like, oh, <laughs> here she goes again. <laughs> Yeah, you know, my dad did say, you know, when he read it, um, cause you know, the book is dedicated to them and, and we were going for a walk somewhere and he was like, I was uncomfortable and unhappy the whole time I read this book until the end. And I was like, oh, sorry, dad. <laughs> but I think part of that is that he's sort of, he's seeing himself and it's sort of like hearing yourself on a voicemail and you're like, Ooh, <laughs> you know? Yeah. We have a question in our Q&A that said that um, Robin would like to hear how you decide on the structure of the book because you mentioned writing the first sentence later. Yes. Um, so I cannot write or think chronologically to save my life. And it, it makes writing, you know, such a frustrating process, but I think it creates really interesting things in the end. So when I write, I am writing, you know, all things at all times. So I'll like write a page, you know, of Ren and then the next page I'm like, oh, here's Flynn and then jump around. And then kind of what I had to do once I get down all these pieces is like print it out and sort of like make a patchwork quilt of it and move things around and sort of see. So 
Um, I try to trust my subconscious at the beginning. And then I sort of have to shut off my writer brain and sort of say, okay, I need this to like make sense. So, you know, the, the way the book is written, it's sort of, instead of moving forward, it kind of goes backward in time. And I, I didn't quite realize when I was doing it that what, what I was really trying to, I think, mimic in the structure of the book is like what it's like to carry generational trauma. Because I think, uh, you know, for Ren, every moment that she's experienced, she's sort of like, there's these like echoes of lives behind her, you know, through um, her mother. And then, you know, Ivy experiences echoes through her mother and her grandmother. And so sometimes what ends up happening is these women are kind of like experiencing two or three moments at once, but aren't quite aware of, of what's happening. So I think I wanted to write a coming of age story that kind of went back to go forward, if that makes sense. And um, when I raised the question at the beginning of the novel that, you know, there's this fire, somebody catches on fire, Briar puts it out. And it's this very like explosive moment. I think to really understand like what's at stake there, you have to go back. And um, I wanted Ren to sort of in her growing up, be able to answer some questions about the past of her parents. So um, the book is written kind of in the way that it rolled out in my brain because as I was writing, I was actually traveling back, uh, but it took a lot of work to make it make sense and to try to give it some forward momentum so it still feels satisfying as because you want to also write something that's going to make somebody want to turn the page, right? So um, that took a lot of work, but it um, the structure was sort of like, the structure stayed the same. You know, and the, what I ended up doing from beginning to end was sort of like trying to shuffle around the pieces and revealing when to reveal all those sort of like secret pieces of the story. Sometimes like when you're writing a rough draft, all the secrets sort of show up at once and then you kind of have to go back and figure out how to lay them out so that people will want to keep reading. Yeah. Okay. It's a, I, I know writers that outline and things like, and I wish I could work like that. And I, my process is just so messy. <laughs> it works. I kept thinking like, oh, it, it gives like definition of thinking a place is backwards. It's like That's how you have to understand it in some ways. Too. Yeah, and I th there is something that is, is really important about sort of like tunneling backward, especially when, when we're thinking about you know, silences that are created from these like moments of trauma. And, um, you know, so much of what we think about is like a good read has this like forward motion. And then when you ask me, you know, what is different about the way a woman tells a story? I think often the way women are experiencing stories is heading back and is looking into the past to understand the present moment instead of sort of being like, I'm barreling ahead to sort of say, no, like, let's try to understand what, like, how do we get here, you know? Um, well, if anybody has any questions in the chat, I have one more question, but I yeah. questions, feel free. We um, had some written down and then some of these are just are coming to mind. Yeah. yeah, ask anything. Okay, well, I um, wanted to ask, hold on, we have one more question. Um, Daniel said, would you want Shiner to be made into a movie? Oh, this is a great question. If so, who could you see playing the characters? Okay, yeah. I, I mean, you know, from your lips to God's ears, like that would be amazing. <laughs> Even though I think it's probably so weird to see something that you've played out in your mind, like through somebody else's eyes, but I think it would, I would love it. I just think it would make such a fun film just because sense of place is so powerful. So let me see. So when I was writing it, I keep changing my mind, you know, cause like, <clears throat> when I was casting people, it would be like so-and-so from like 30 years ago, <laughs> you know, like I love um, Michael B. Jordan, but he, so him, you know, maybe back when he was in like Friday Night Lights could be Caleb, but now obviously he's too old. But when I was writing, I really saw uh, Michael Fassbender as Briar. Cause I think he gets that sort of like broody, you know, attractiveness um Ren I have no idea I'm taking suggestions <laughs> any. um 
If you have any suggestions, put them in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me see. Ruby started out as, um, I'm forgetting her name, but she played Ellen in Damages. Ru Rose Byrne. That's who, who started out. Right now, I'm feeling like Rooney Mara would do a wonderful job with Ruby. Ivy has also changed quite a bit. I think Rachel Evan Wood, or is it Evan Rachel Wood? Oh my goodness. I, Rachel Evan Wood, one of those. I think she would be really good because she's kind of got that creepy creepiness. Um, but I also am like, I would love to see Amy Adams in the film somewhere. So who knows, you know? Um, and then Flynn, it's funny. Some people have told me that they would love to see um, Timothy Oliphant as him. He was in Justified um, and he's great. I saw um, Tim Riggins from Friday Night Lights um, as a kind of like a, the teenage version of Flynn who would now, you know, be grown up. <laughs> so, Yeah. Right. What do you guys think? I'm always curious to see what people think. I felt like this book related so much to Witcher's Bone. So I kept thinking of Ren as Jennifer Lawrence. Yes, 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 agreed. And and so like back when this book, I was dreaming this book, I was like, I just want Jennifer Lawrence to like star in all my books, you know? So now she's too old because it takes me so long to write a book. <laughs> so Allison's more the movie, the movie fan than me. I'm all these people you're saying I'm like I don't know who that is I know <laughs> reads a hundred books like yeah. that. I'm reading I can't I can't watch that's, movies. Only so that's much the, the better choice <laughs> <laughs> um okay I have one more question and yeah I don't know if this is a, an answer but I have wondered about the title that yeah. because of course it relates to moonshine and then also yeah. relates to the eye too like if you have a shine yeah Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, do you have, like, when you thought of the title, was there any significance behind it? You know, I think that the significance of it for me was thinking about a young woman making the choice to live, to go the road less traveled, you know, to live a life, <clears throat> maybe as an outlaw, maybe as something that steps outside what was given to her. And, and I thought the title shiner really captured that idea of like what it means to kind of go after what you want um and I also I just something I mean there's so many things that happen in the book that are like so intense and harsh I feel like all the moonshine stuff sort of just like softens those hard edges and so I wanted you know I wanted to find a way to like draw the reader in and not have them be like, oh, this is going to be a really hard read, you know, cause that's not, that's not true of what life is like there. And I, I feel like Shiner embodies all that toughness, but all that heart too, you know, um, and all that beauty and all that mystery. So, so that's kind of like why I chose it. Cause I felt like it had a little bit of mystery, but it also, when you hear that word, it conjures like really specific things in a really specific place. So, love it. yeah. Thank you so much, Amy. I truly, truly appreciate you being here. Um, we, I don't, you can stick around. We are going to announce yeah. our month's book. Ooh, of course I want to stick around. <laughs> Thank you for your time and just giving even more life to this book. Again, we will continue to put this in people's hands here in Waco and, um, you know, just keep writing. And if you want to write a sequel about, Caleb and Ren, we're all for it. Yeah. Okay. That was, consider it on my list. But again, thank you so much. Like, honestly, this is like doing things like this is the highlight for, for any author. So thank you so much for having me and for reading the book, everybody. Thank you. Yay. Okay. So drum roll. Our book for next month will be 50 Words for Rain by Asha Lemmy. Uh, this is a debut book. I picked it up uh, maybe in August, it just had a pretty cover. So I thought I'd give it a, give it a go. And I was blown away by this story. It's a, a really neat story. It takes place in Japan. Uh, it's a little, it's also a kind of a, a little girl's coming of age in a very difficult, um, she's a biracial daughter um, who's kind of abandoned by most people in her life, but she, um, you just cheer for her the whole time. She makes her way in the world. And 
the author will be joining us as well. So it is it is fabulous. Um, I can't speak more highly of it. And um, please read it, pick it up at Fabled. We have copies there. We can, you can order it online um, and join us. It'll be November the 17th, Tuesday night at seven o'clock. And Amy, Joe, I must say, you are one of the sweetest, most gracious authors that I have spoken to. And we will read anything that you write. We're yes. so thankful for you. Thank you again. Well, I put him <laughs> for our next book club in the chat. If you'd like to look at it, purchase your book at Fabled. We have several copies. Register. Um, again, Amy Joe, thank you so much. And thank you guys. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. y'all have a good night. Stay safe and yeah. safe. Yeah. Stay safe, everybody. Take care. <laughs>